more to do on hydrogen burning, and then I'm going to go into helium. My voice tone will change. Nobody. Um, but I thought many, many people have asked me in the last few days how things went in Santa Barbara. So I thought I'd show you some images. Um, when you see a pyrocumulus cloud, you know that things are bad. Uh, what a pyrocumulus cloud is, that you can't, there's no scale here, but that's, that, that top of that cloud is up at around probably 30,000 feet. Um, that's uh, cold air dragged by the hot air to high altitude, so it's cold air with water in it, and of course you form a cloud, that's why it's called pyrocumulus. Um, so that was in the morning at 6.30. Uh, I decided to go to KITP and see how things were going to hold up at the Institute. And that's what it looked like around 2.30 uh, from, well, you can see where we are, for those of you who know KITP, looking back across Goleta Beach. So that's the hills above Montecito. Um, so that's what it was like. And I, since, we're, since I'm going to do flames today, I figured it was best to start with the real ones. So um, thankfully, that's over. All right. So let me just pick up where I left off, which is I I'd finished up sort of explaining some of the physics of hydrogen burning. But what I want to do now is briefly go through a few examples of astrophysical systems that actually do this, as opposed to uh, what I was doing, which was mostly mathematics. Um, so there are, roughly speaking, three classes of hydrogen systems. So Stirl already talked about the cataclysmic variables, and I'm going to use them as my main highlight, because those are the systems from which most of the classical novae are observed, typical orbital periods of a few hours. There's another class, which I also will talk about towards the a little bit later today, uh, the super soft sources. Um, th those typically were thought to be accreting at very high rates in that narrow, stable regime. As I'll show you, most of the super soft sources that we observe in distant galaxies are actually classical novae that sit as a super soft source for a finite amount of time. There's also some really wide binaries called symbiotics. They're called symbiotics because they're a red giant with a white dwarf, and the spectrum is symbiotic in nature, it's a very cold spectrum from the red giant, and then often with uh, lines of very high ionization states. So where do these systems sit in accretion rate? So again, this is a plot like what I showed the other day. Um, so here's the narrow region of stable hydrogen burning. This is mass accretion rate versus mass of the white dwarf. And now what I'm showing uh, as when you're unstable, I talked about the limit cycle of accumulating for a finite time and then having uh, a thermonuclear instability that leads to mass loss. And what's shown here is the amount of mass that's accumulated on the white dwarf. So this is uh, 10 to the minus 5 solar masses. For lower accretion rates and cold objects, you get down to 10 to the minus 4 solar masses. And this is the accretion rate regime of the cataclysmic variables, which is what I will d really discuss. And so these objects that Stroll talked about with uh, typical low mass main sequence donors, orbital periods, 8 hours all the way down to um, 60, 70 minutes, are in this regime of very low accretion rate. So of course the ones we see in our galaxy, we, we know they're accreting at these rates from the studies observationally, but typically for those that we know that are in our galaxy that we already know as CVs, they typically haven't shown a novae event. And the reason for that is the recurrence time. So you can see if it's 10 to the minus 5 solar masses and I'm accreting at 10 to the minus 9 solar masses per year, we're talking 10 to the 4 years. And so most of these that we see, um, when they do pop off on our galaxy, are often systems that we didn't know about until they revealed themselves via the thermonuclear uh, instability of the, from the hydrogen that's accumulated. There is a hypothesis of a, a bunch of systems up here that are in this narrow regime uh, that were f favored as um, what are called these super soft sources. It was a, one mechanism brought up that Dan already talked about yesterday of a way to potentially build up some fuel on the star, some material on the star by having it burn and not get lost in an explosion. Um, I, I still think many of us are worried about those in that case as well because the helium that accumulates, as I talked about, is also unstable. So it's not really clearly going to solve uh, what we're looking for, for the type 1a at least. Okay, so Stroll did mass transfer in great detail, so I can skip this slide. But let me just show you roughly what happens in a typical evolutionary projection of a cataclysmic variable. So 
This is uh, from Hal Nelson and Rappaport, so let me just slow down briefly and walk you through this. So the top plot is showing the mass accretion rate, mass transfer rate, starting around 10 to the minus 8, so the system comes into contact at an age of around 10 million years. What this is is a white dwarf of some mass. It doesn't really matter for this. Let's presume they did 0.6. And at an orbital period, uh, which is here of about eight hours, it's about a 0.8 solar mass main sequence star. So it's roughly a 0.8 solar mass main sequence star, comes into contact at eight hours, starts to do mass transfer. In this case, the angular momentum loss is driven by something we refer to as magnetic breaking. And you can see that the mass transfer rates are in this regime of 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. So if I go back <coughs> to here, I'm in a regime of unstable burning, for sure. Okay? And so I should, from those systems, have classical novae occurring. At orbital periods, again, of, and I'm, I'm going to sh explain this because I'm going to talk about the orbital periods of classical novae, of again, sort of eight hours down to a few hours. Around 0.3 solar masses, so from here to here, the mass of the donor has whittled down to around point, roughly 0.3. There's magic that occurs. Stroll, did you talk about magic at three hours? I did not talk about magic. I, I resisted the temptation. Okay. Um, so you may notice that the theorists suddenly turn off mass transfer and then wait a while as gravitational waves brings the system back into contact. This is to create what's observed, which is called the period gap. I'll show you that in the next plot. Um, the, the period gap is that there's very few systems that are doing mass transfer between two and three hours. They come back into contact, and from here on in time, uh, it's just undergoing mass transfer driven by gravitational wave losses. So from two hours all the way down to an uh, orbital period of 70 minutes, at which point the donor is pretty much a, a brown dwarf, undergoes further mass loss and expands, so the orbital period increases. But you can see in time, the, re the main reason I want to show this plot is you can see that this is log time. So if you start systems here, you can see that they, most of the time will be spent at this late stage. And that's just because at that point, the gravitational wave time scale is very long. And throughout this whole evolution, what's quite remarkable is I've transferred, in this case, I've gone from 0.8 down to 0.1 for sure. So 7 tenths of a solar mass of material has been put on that white dwarf, which is why people like to have these, talk about these as type 1a supernovae, though the reality, I, we think, is that it's pretty much impossible because of the classical novae events that I'm going to talk about, which just lead to complete mass loss. But there's a lot of mass transfer that's happened in all these systems. Okay, so <clears throat> the question is, if this is the typical evolution, of a system that we expect theoretically, and there's a lot of observational support for this mass transfer history as a function of time, what would we see if we went out and just found classical novae? So again, the classical novae we observe would be typically in our galaxy, 20 a year in uh, distant galaxies, as I was mentioning before, you know, maybe up to 50 per year. In distant galaxies, I can't get the orbital period after the explosion, because I can't find anything. But in, the, in our galaxy, you can. In the Magellanic Clouds, you can. And so the question is, where would we expect to find them during this evolution? So you've all had your lunch. You're now in that place where your blood sugar is dropping. You're about to fall asleep. So time for the quiz. So up here, they're accreting at a rapid rate, right? 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. Let's go back to this plot. Right? The typical accumulated mass is around between 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 5. And then at a later stage, they're accumulating at a much lower accretion rate, and the shell masses are even higher. Right? So if you think of the recurrence time, the recurrence time is going to be much higher when they're accreting more rapidly than when they're accreting lower, at a lower rate. Okay? So, so where do you think we're going to find them? 
But of course, they're, they're spending much more time here. Okay, you, you don't know. That's good. I'll show you. Here's what the CV orbital period distribution is, actually, of the CVs themselves. This is not the Novi. These are the CVs. So this is from a recent uh, paper from Boris Gansik, his group. Here's the period gap highlighted in green, in case you didn't notice. Um, they always do things in log period of days. I don't know why they do this. It kind of drives me crazy because I'd like to see it in hours. Um, but these are the systems above the period gap. Accreting rapidly should spend less time, right? So this should look like that other plot. Then they accrete for a much longer time in the period minimum, where the minimum is, I think, this blue, this blue region. And so, indeed, we see many more systems down here than here. But again, these are not the novae. These are the systems that are undergoing the mass transfer. So uh, Dean Townsley and I did this. It's now been a decade ago. I don't really know if it's changed much, because getting orbital periods for novae is not a rapid field of discovery. Uh, but this bottom plot is the histogram. The histogram you're seeing here are the orbital periods of classical novae in our galaxy, where they've measured them. And what you see is that most of them are up above the period gap. And there's very few down here. Right? And the reason for that, and that's what these, what these curves are showing, is that basically once you convolve the evolution that I showed with the change in the ignition mass or the change in the recurrent, occur, occurrence time, occurrence rate, um, you, you can sort of more or less understand the orbital period distribution observed of the classical novae is that most of them that we see are indeed up here in the, in the higher um, orbital periods. There's one other point I want to make, however. The other thing you may notice is that there also could well be a bias to, get to see higher mass white dwarfs for the same cause, which is the higher mass white dwarfs have thinner shells before they ignite. And because of that, the rate of the occurrence on the higher mass is higher. And so, you, so if we could have a mass distribution, the expectation, again, is that it would be a very biased mass distribution. And I'm saying that because you're going to see that the minute I start talking about what's happening in M31. Okay. Okay. All right, so any questions about that? Okay, so as I ended my discussion last time, the, one of the major problems that we don't, I would say really we don't have a good handle on, is how to understand the mass loss. So these objects, as I mentioned before, uh, undergo dramatic expansion in radius. They approach the Eddington limit. They're losing mass either because of super Eddington winds, or they've overflowed their Roche lobe, or the, because they've basically formed a common envelope. And so I'm not going to talk about the outburst light curves. I'm not going to do any of that. Instead, what I want to talk about is a phase after that's over, which is that the white dwarf always has some hydrogen left behind, and it has a period of stable burning of what remains. And so um, that's what's called the super soft phase. So there's always a certain amount that's left. Uh, basically, the white dwarf shrinks back inside its Roche lobe. So if you look after the Novi event uh, at the object with an X-ray telescope, you will see uh, what's called a super soft emission, typically 40 to 100 EV black body emission, having to do with the white dwarf sitting there just burning whatever was left. Um, that ends up being important, we think, for other work we've been doing on the radio emission. So if you look at um, Novi after for quite a long time, the ejecta that went out stays extremely hot, around 10 to the 4 Kelvin. And this post Novi white dwarf is the ionizing source that's actually keeping that ejecta at 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Otherwise, it should have uh, undergone um, just temperature decline because of adiabatic expansion. So what I want to do is uh, sort of highlight a little bit of this physics and then jump into what's been happening in M31. So let me give you some masses uh, to give you a sense for what we're talking about. So uh, what's shown here, actually this is not quite coming through. So this is the recurrence time of the Novi as a function of the hydrogen ignition mass for different mass white dwarves, with an emphasis now on massive white dwarves from 1 up to near Chandra Sakar around 1.3. So what's shown here is the amount of mass at the time of the ignition. So typically, we're getting 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 5. So when I sh last time was saying that delta M, the mass accumulated, much, is much less than the mass of the white dwarf, this is now proof that that was not a bad approximation. 
And um, the expectation is that not all of this leaves because once the mass gets down to a value uh, where the white dwarf radius can shrink inside the Roche lobe and it gets a little bit sub-Eddington, it should stay and sit and burn for a bit of time. And so the question is, can we confirm or deny that this is the amount of mass that's typically on the object? So here's what happens in the HR diagram. I showed this before. The phase I want to emphasize now is as the object comes from being very large off to the right, sort of off the plot, comes down, what's going to happen is that we're going to see that the object basically sits at this knee, having a radius that's maybe a little bit bigger than the, than the zero temperature white dwarf radius, and burning hydrogen. And so its evolution slows, and it gets stuck here. And it's this x-ray phase that you can see in distant galaxies, or you can see it in our galaxy as well. OK. So this is something you can calculate. And so uh, my view, if you can calculate something, you should. It's even better if you can do it before the observers have found it, um, though they get really upset if you tell them, oh, you're just finding what we predicted. They don't like that. I suggest you be patient with them. Uh, but they prefer to prove you wrong, so even when you're right. OK. Um, so here's what, here's what you would predict. So let's just look at this plot is all we need. So what this is showing is the effective temperature of the white dwarf as a function of luminosity. So it's a little blow up of an HR diagram showing the evolution of different mass objects. So let's just walk through one. Um, let's walk through this 1.3. These, these um, triangles are showing the evolution in time with a time stamp of three days. So it sits here for three days, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. So it would be an x-ray source for maybe 20 days. That's because it's a massive object with a very small, thin hydrogen layer. If I come all the way over to something like a 0.6, what you would first see is that it's not as hot. The reason for that is because the object's much larger in radius, and to have that luminosity, it doesn't need to get as hot. But what you also see is that the timestamp of evolution is much, much slower. So it'll sit here for, this is 10 years from here to here, another 10, another 10. So sort of nearly a century, OK? So now if you go out and you look in our galaxy and you find a super soft source, um, you need to be careful. It might not be what you think it is. It may not be one that's burning in that stable regime. It may be a novi that you missed and is now just sitting here burning its residual fuel. OK, so that's an ambiguity that we have. Um, for more massive objects, they don't last that long, and especially in distant galaxies, you usually don't miss the novae. Okay? So that's what I'm going to talk about in M31. But you can also see from this, there should be a direct correlation, that if the observer measures the temperature, let's say they say it's between 80 and 100 EV, you would say it has to be a massive white dwarf, and then you would basically have a prediction, which is that the evolution time should be 30 days. That's about it. Okay? OK, so any questions on this? Yep. So this allows the velocity of evolution times called roughly a factor of 2 in the mass of the white dwarf. This is because of the high dependence of the nuclear reactions on the temperature? No, it's mostly um, the fact that the, the mass of the shell is very dependent on the mass of the white dwarf. So as you get to very high mass white dwarfs, the gravity is really high. And as the gravity is high, the, the layers that you need to reach that pressure are of much smaller mass. And that's what this is. So let me go back to the mass of the shell, because that, that's where you can see this. I don't even have 0.6 on this plot. But you can see as I go from 1 to 1.3, the mass of the shell goes down by almost a factor of 100. So why is that? Why does so to get the ignition to occur, you typically, it's not quite true to say you need to get to a fixed pressure. It's not quite right, but let's just say that. Um, and, and remember, for a fixed pressure, if I'm in plane parallel, uh, that goes like the mass divided by the radius to the fourth times delta m. And the radius really shrinks as you go to high mass for white dwarfs. And it's going like r to the fourth. Okay. So, so that's, that, that's most of this dynamic range you're seeing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's a, a nice... This is an old PTF image of M31, the Andromeda galaxy. Um, it's well monitored by many, many groups. 
for everything, including Novi. And so most Novi and M31 are, are found. And there's been a, a, a large effort with XMM, with Chandra, with many, many X-ray telescopes to look constantly at M31 and then ask, when I go and look at M31 this year versus last year, are there any new sources? And lo and behold, there are. Most of the new sources are Novi that have gone off. And so this is a recent paper from Henze, who's primarily been the, the main one sort of cataloging this. Each of the circles here that say M31N is a location of a Novi. Um, and you can see in some of them, it's kind of hard. Maybe you can see there's a little red object there. That's a super soft source. Maybe it's easier on the screens. Uh, the SPH is, is not smooth particle hydrodynamics. Uh, rather, it's a system that was, that it's a, something that was not a Novi. But you can see the majority of the things they've circled here are Novi. If you use Chandra and zoom in, uh, again, you, this is a little bit better because for most of these bullseyes, there's a super soft source. And again, this is data from 2011, I believe. So you can see some have gone away. There's nothing in the 2009 Novi, but in the 2011 Novi, there's something. Uh, here's a 2010 that's still on, right? And so I'm going to show you the result of this, um, which is how long did they stay on, right? So you know when the Novi started, somebody, then you found it in x-rays, and you can ask, how long did the x-ray emission last? OK? So this is what they found. This is the most recent uh, compilation. This is from about a year and a half ago. So as a function of black body temperature, this is what they call the turnoff time. I would just call it the duration. Um, so these are the data. So the correlation, if you will, is that the hotter systems uh, have a shorter amount of time they're on. Okay, which is which is what I showed. All right, so just to remind you, uh, so let's do a check. Let's be bold. So at 50 EV, I don't know, what do you want to do? 200 days? So at 50 EV, so here's 60. I go up, the circles are around, these are around 100 days. Yeah, 60 EV. I mean, I've got a plot to show this. Here's what the plot looks like. Um, so these are, these are data from the original Henze paper or the, or the big bars. And some of these are actually galactic super soft sources. Some of these are things in M31. The galactic sources are a bit easier. And what's shown here is a relationship from theory for these. And the first thing that should really scare you is that these are massive white dwarves. These are all one. I mean, look, this is one. Okay. So this is the biggest worry I have, is this works, this theory works well, the observations are great. Um, you can't get that hot if you're not this massive, but these are the majority of the Novi we're seeing in M31. So they're not 0.8, they're not 0.7, they're not 0.6. And there's very few that don't have a super soft phase. So there's probably some in there that are off the chart, right? Especially with absorption, as you get a little bit um, co colder, the absorption is a problem, but typically, um, this is what you find, and the expectation here is this is, we think this is just selection, which is that the, the rate is higher for more massive white dwarfs. But remember, I showed you yesterday that massive white dwarfs are really rare. Okay, so, I mean, we've written papers on this. Monica Sorosam did some really nice work with Maran Gilfanov for her thesis, also saying this was okay, but, you know, it's a little bit worrisome. Okay, so what I want to wrap up on the hydrogen is that while all this was happening, um, Su Min Tang and a number of us had a fun time because of PTF monitoring of M31 that allowed us to find simultaneously with another group uh, a new recurrent novae. It wasn't new, it was new to us, uh, which went off. This is the first time we found it now, it was four years ago. Um, but it, was a, it, was, it had been found in PTF. These are just images to prove it was in PTF. Um, but here are some old, here are different light curves, and the notice was it was going off. Here's a 2009, 2011, 2012, 2013, extremely short. I haven't shown you Novi light curves, but it only lasted two to five days. And uh, this ends up being the sh fastest recurrent Novi that's known. It's, it has a recurrence time of one year or half a year. 
Now you can say, boy, what's the problem? The observers know the problem with one year or half a year, or at least one year. If it's, if it's behind the sun, you get, you, there's times you don't see it. Um, so I'm just going to say it's one year. For one year, if I go back to the theory plot, to get a one-year recurrence time, so remember this is the plot I showed you at the very beginning, um, this is the, I have to be in this little box right here. We cut this off at the Chandrasekhar mass, okay? So for a one-year recurrence time, that system has to be in that box. So it's about as short, and if it, goes to ha if it goes to half a year, I'm even more worried. So I'm going to say for now it's a year. The observers haven't decided. Um, so we had a lot of fun with this because the typical recurrent novae before then was, I don't know what, 30 years or, do you remember? 10? Yeah. So this is a little bit scary, especially when you've done theory and it's sort of right at the edge of what you've calculated. So basically it would say that this white dwarf has got to be, um, you know, 1.3x, uh, creating it 10 to the minus 7 you know, this high accretion rate, and Bill Wolf did the calculations as fast as possible because what we were interested in, because Bill had done this previous work on understanding the super soft phase, was as fast as he could get a prediction about the super soft phase. And of course, the expectation is it would be really short and quite hot because it should be a massive white dwarf. And we triggered SWIFT. Um, and this is what it looked like back then. This is our paper in 2014. Um, it lasted only about 15 days or 10 days. Um, and the temperature was nearly a tenth of a kilovolt, so 100 eV. Now, while we were doing this, it is fun to do detective work. Um, I actually realized while we were writing this paper up that this thing was known to the X-ray observers. So here's a paper from 1995. This is a little bit embarrassing. There was a, a recurrent super soft X-ray transient in M31 by Nick White and company. Uh, they noticed this thing three times. It had popped off. There, nobody was doing Novi work. If they'd been looking, they would have seen the Novi, but it was not known. So it was just a recurrent X-ray source. And what's remarkable is this last paragraph. A fit to a white dwarf model gives a temperature of 10 to the 6 Kelvin. That's, that's 100 EV. Uh, the hottest found so far. Right? So everybody knows that. The high temperature is consistent with a white dwarf mass of 1.3 to 1.4. <laughs> approaching the Chandrasekhar limit and burning close to the nuclear stability limit. So they nailed it, okay? <laughs> they completely nailed it. Um, we thought we were smart, but they got us. Um, and for that reason, I always refer to the sources RxJ0045. Uh, another group refuses to do that, but I think the appropriate thing is this is first found this way. So here's where it sits. So here's a calculation that Bill Wolf did, a sort of a blow up of the region I was talking about for, <clears throat> um, again, the T effective. And so these were the, the data from those original SWIFT observations. And now we're only showing a range from 1.3 up to 1.36. And again, you can see uh, this is five days of evolution. So there's 15. Here's three days of evolution. There's nine. So it's something like uh, probably this 1.34. Extremely close to the Chandrasekhar mass. There's been a lot of work done on this, mostly by Darnley. Um, and in the, recent, in the recent compilation paper, he plotted this plot. He didn't mention whether this agreed with theory, which was kind of annoying to me personally. But it's a nice plot of temperature versus time. And notice the, this is 14, so this is about six days, and it goes from roughly 80 EV up to 120. So let's go back and ask what would we have predicted. Uh, so if I go to six days, so I probably want to be on this curve. You know, 80 to 120 in six days is pretty much this purple line. And again, so we're really pushing up to a high mass. Before I presented this yesterday, I was kind of curious uh, whether this went off. And so I want to thank everybody for waiting a day for, to have me talk about this. Because when I was reading the old papers, they said it should go around New Year's. Well, it went. Here's the ATEL. So it just went last night, 31st of December. <laughs> okay, so it's back. Um, so you'll be reading about it again. Uh, this group, uh, which is this, the Darnley group, usually is a press release. So there'll be something coming out soon. 
Uh, they like to claim it's going to be a type 1a supernovae. Now, it is really close. We don't know what it's made of. We have no idea whether it's oxygen neon at the center or carbon oxygen. If it's oxygen neon, it won't probably be a type 1a. It could be an accretion induced collapse. Um, and it's not probably gathering much material. Um, yep, Svi. Correct. I understand. No, we don't have to add point one, but yeah, but it's. I know. Yeah, we can wait. Yeah, but it would be nice to have a. Yeah, so I thought this was nice. So it did go off last night, and the ATELs are gathering fast. Okay, so I'm done with hydrogen. I'm going to move on to the next element, but let me pause for questions before I. Yes. This? No, no. Uh, so you had a plot for the uh, temperature versus the turnoff time for quite a few other sources. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me go back to the. Uh, yeah, the, this yeah, plot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so why can't you do the same measurement for these species? No, you can't. Sorry. So, so what I'm, I, have, I didn't say it here. I don't have the figure caption. These three points I do know are galactic. Uh, Novi with, that are super soft sources. I don't remember who they are. And then the rest of these were objects in M31 with the big error bars. So, so I don't know if that's answering your question, though. No, I, I was curious if the mass that you, white of mass ah. that you estimate from the CD is the yes. same as what you yeah. Oh, yeah. So actually, in the galactic case, yes is the answer. They're on the same plot. So we make the same inference. Whether it's true or not is a different question. But we'd make the same inference. Right, for the, for the lower mass object, so the real question is, um, not the real question, the other question you could ask is, for what fraction of the novae do we not see a super soft phase? And that the reason for that would be that probably just galactic absorption, right? I mean, this is harder to absorb, but as you get down to, you know, to these lower energies, it gets easier to hide them. Um, but it's typical that you see it. So we would like to do that from the radio. So the major way to, conf to really play this game for the typical novae, if you're not seeing the super soft phase, which you often can't because they're in the galactic disk, is to, is to look at the radio emission after the fact. So the ejecta as it expands is being photoionized by this emission, right? Because this is you know, 20 eV, so this is photoionizing emission. And that basically keeps that ejecta extremely hot as it expands and gives you uh, the radio emission. That's pretty much how you can understand the late time radio. By late time, I mean for years, you'll see it. Stro. So you were worried about the masses and that if I was calculating temperatures, you can easily have them there. If you had point six, aren't they so cool you would never find them in the X-rays? Um, well, here's the point six. Right. Yeah, well, so it's 20. Yeah, that's, no, that's what I mean by absorption in this case, yeah. Yeah, or even otherwise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, so for these, for, for the, the, the worry is that it's so damn prevalent. Right, you're just worried about the absolute numbers. Exactly. Numbers the exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right. So it's a population question that's, that, that is worrisome. Yeah, you're right. So, so if, if if, if the expectation was that the mass distribution had anything to do like what we see for isolated field white dwarfs, right? You know, the ratio of these to those is like a factor of 100, right? So it gets uncomfortable. I mean, that's my worry. And it's not a factor of 100. Oh, well, okay, we can, yeah. It, this should be done more carefully, I guess, is the bottom line. Okay. Everybody's ready for helium? Okay, onward. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is helium. So just to remind you uh, what we've sort of finished up is the hydrogen burning. We're now going to jump up to helium. The stable, as I derived last time, same calculation. There's a narrow range for st steady helium burning. Um, it's typically a factor of 10 higher. That's because, remember, the energy release per gram is much less by a factor of five. 
and it um, has a higher editing to limit because it's less opaque. And so um, that's how we get this factor of 10. Also what's shown here is just when you go stable, what are the recurrence times? So these are again are in years. So if, if you had a uh, helium novae that was a recurrent novae with three years, you'd again sort of almost be you know, just up in, in this regime. What's shown on here is one evolution path um, that's actually, which I'm going to talk about probably not today, but probably in the next lecture, uh, which is a regime where you can actually do steady burning and increase the mass of a white dwarf. So this is a rather suggestive curve that gets you near to the, well, basically in that case drives you to uh, core something, core ignition if it's CO, core electron capture if it's oxygen neon, uh, of a white dwarf that is in a binary scenario that actually lets you do stable burning. So there are three scenarios I want to talk about. So for CVs, I really just emphasized uh, that, the, that class. For the helium systems, A, we don't have as many, so we don't really know as much. And B, uh, we have a, a diversity of systems that we're still actively considering. So a lot of what I'm going to show you now is much more theory than observation because we only have one helium novae as far as we know, which I'm just going to show you a little bit about. And everything else is, at this point, pure theoretical speculation. So there's three classes of mass transfer. I'm going to go through two of them today, uh, these two systems. I'm going to hold back on the helium star donor until next time, whenever that is. And so there's two systems I'm going to talk about. One is where the, what's coming in to do the mass transfer onto the white dwarf is a helium white dwarf of low mass, typically point two, five, or less. That's one type of binary, which I'll talk about. The other type is a system that has been uh, in the literature for quite a while, which is a helium burning star that's called a subdwarf B star that is um, undergoing helium burning, comes in uh, under gravitational waves, has mass transfer contact, and also then backs out. These systems are now of interest because we actually have some in our galaxy that are on their way to forming, contact, come into contact. So we don't have any examples of systems that are presently accreting, but we have systems that when we run them forward in time, will come into contact and do mass transfer. We have many systems out here at low orbital periods. Those are a whole class of binaries called AMCVNs that Sterl mentioned with orbital periods of five minutes all the way up to 65 minutes. The mass transfer rates are really low. Uh, we've not seen any helium novae from them because the recurrence times are so long. Okay. Again, just to remind you, here's the steady helium burning, um, and there's the steady hydrogen burning. Okay. So any questions on this plot before I start to dive in? Okay, so this field is getting exciting because we actually have systems that are on their way to starting this mass transfer. And so this is a diagram with way too much data, but that's a good sign. So I'm not going to really explain everything on this plot. These are double white dwarf binaries, white dwarf plus SDB stars and a few pulsars. It's a plot that David Kaplan made for a different paper. Um, but what's shown here that's important is this is the orbital period of the system. And this time of 100 million years is the time to contact under gravitational wave losses for these systems. And here's 10 giga years. So everything to the left of this line, all of these systems, to the left of that line will come into contact within a Hubble time. And, and this plot used to be pretty empty. And it's not empty anymore. That's the major message. All these circles, these guys uh, with the circles, these are all very low mass uh, helium white dwarves, less than 0.2, the so-called elms, extremely low mass white dwarves. They do hydrogen burning and they stay bright for a long period, which lets us find them. But the key point is that they are in binaries with other typically more, well, more massive white dwarves. This is the total mass on this axis. Um, and so these are systems typically with a 0.6 and a 0.2 or a 0.8 and a 0.2. Um, and then there's, and, and all of these will come into contact. And there's some that'll come into contact. Here's a million years. Here's a guy sitting right here, the million year time scale. So that'll happen right when that 1A goes off in M31, okay? So set your watch. All right, so 
The reason this, to me this has gotten to be more concrete of, of a story is that we're not depending on population synthesis to tell us what to calculate. We actually have systems on the sky that we can measure and run them forward in time. And that's really what I, talk, what I want to talk about. So as I'll go through these low mass helium white dwarves, the accretion rates are mostly in the unstable regime. The flashes are weak. I'll describe what I mean by weak. These burning helium white dwarf cores are SDB stars. Um, they accrete for this long time and they build up a really thick unstable helium shell that is going to be very interesting for a possibility of a detonation. And the more massive helium burning cores I'm going to put off uh, till tomorrow. So there's only one known helium novae, V445 Puppis. Uh, it's at about eight and a half kiloparsecs away. Uh, it went off, I don't know now, it's been 15 years, something like that. So the major thing to keep in mind is that helium's harder to ignite. You'll build up much more of it. So when it goes, there's more to give. <coughs> and so all the time scales are longer. Um, this one's quite interesting. It kind of looks like the image Stirl showed. I don't know what that was. Was that a planetary? Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's been a, you know, I don't, I, I almost was going to email um, Patrick Wout, who's been doing this, because it's been quiet. There hasn't been a paper on this object for like three or four years. Um, but you can see as a function of time, this is the ejecta expanding. There's clearly something going on that's confining it. It's moving out at a few uh, thousand kilometers per second, but by measuring the motion on the sky, they actually got the distance. Um, so here's their table from the Wout et al. So it is at about eight kiloparsecs. The velocity of the outward flow is six to 8,000 kilometers per second, sort of as you'd expect. There's no hydrogen, by the way. Sorry, I should just say that. There's no hydrogen seen ever. Okay, so, um, and the, the problem is, we have, there, is, there is a progenitor known. Um, now that we have the distance, you can get an absolute magnitude, but there's a big concern about circumstellar material for this object. So of course, there's the reddening correction for the galaxy, but because of this uh, sort of hourglass issue, there's a concern of evidence for circumstellar which could add, you know, can bring it up. So right now, the expect, right now the claim is that the luminosity of the progenitor for this was about 10 to the 4 L sun, which is, I would say, a difficult thing to understand. If it were a double white dwarf, it would be much, much fainter. The STB stars are much, much fainter. Um, so pre-explosion. Pre so, yeah. Well, the, the 10 to the 4 number had a circumstellar reddening that had this, yeah. Yeah, that has, the, yeah, that's right. So, so, ten, so 10 to the 3, it had a factor of 10, yeah. So, so okay, so this is a funny system, but it's, at least there's one. So unlike Novi, where we've got 20 per year, so you may remember yesterday, actually, let's see. Does anybody remember? What was the Novi rate I told you for helium Novi? Dun, 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 dun. Stroll can't answer it. <laughs> All right. It was about one per 200 years is what I, what I roughly said. It's about the same as the 1A rate. So, you know, how long have we been doing optical astronomy well enough to know there's no hydrogen? 40 years, 50 years? Okay, Stroll, now you can speak. I, you, you got something to say, I can see it. No, okay. <laughs> okay. So, you know, from one you get a rate. Obviously, that's a standard thing we do all the time. Okay, so let me talk, let me start diving into what this looks like. So let's understand the first case. This is a, a, a plot that's far too busy, uh, but you're going to get the main message. So what's calculated here are on a 0.8 solar mass white dwarf, different types of low mass white dwarfs coming in of helium from 0.125 up to 0.2. So this, these are these really low mass objects. Uh, they come in under gravitational waves uh, and they start having contact at different orbital periods depending on their hydrogen envelope. That was the main purpose of this work we did. But it, don't really worry about that. Uh, basically they come in, they lose their hydrogen envelope very quickly 
and then start doing mass transfer of helium, and you can see the orbital periods are four or five minutes. And they, they can have mass transfer rates very briefly in the stable regime, but very quickly as the object expands under mass loss and the orbital period widens, goes back out, they go through uh, a, a very large decline in their mass transfer rate from 10 to the minus 6 all the way down to 10 to the minus 10 over a time scale, in this case, uh, down to 10 to the minus 10 is probably about a giga year. And these will all be unstable, right? but a huge dynamic range. So you can take one of these and, and undergo accretion and explosion, and this is what they roughly look like. This is an early calculation with MESA of one of these systems. It doesn't really matter which one, but this is time since accretion started. You can see the axis here is really short, 10 to the 4 to a million years. The top plot is just showing the succession flashes of the luminosity. Um, this is the nuclear burning luminosity. This is not the stellar luminosity, so don't panic. Okay, this is not 10 to the 10 L sun coming out of the star. This is 10 to the 10 L sun being generated in a nuclear burning shell, which is what I'll talk about. This is showing the accumulation of the mass um, and then the ejection, accumulation, ejection, sawtooth. And you can see the masses are quite small. Except at very late times as the accretion rate drops, you actually can start building up large shells uh, around, in this case, around 0.02. And this is what I'm going to really emphasize, and I'm going to do some work at the chalkboard, which is that for helium burning, you get into a very different burning regime that's interesting, which is you can get uh, time scales. This is what we call the heating time. This is the time scale on which the temperature in the burning layer is doubling. Okay. So it's sort of a characteristic time scale, T over T dot. And for these flashes that are what I would call weak, the time scale is 1,000 seconds. 1,000 seconds is very long compared to, to the dynamical time, even in the burning layer. But as the mass of the shells get large and they're at higher density, you can see this heating time gets down to 10 seconds. And that's what got us interested in this about a decade ago is that this, these final flashes in these cases can become what we call dynamical. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that now. So if I take one of those flashes and watch its evolution in, in rho t space, this is what it looks like. So what's shown here is a profile within the white dwarf. So density is increasing to the right, so the core is off to the right and the surface is off to the left. This, dime, this is showing the base of the accumulated helium. So this, in this case, would be uh, for, a, this is probably carbon oxygen. It doesn't really matter for this. It's just providing gravity. And what you see is that uh, this is the first onset of the shell flash right here. Time t later, it's, the temperature is dramatically increased. I've developed a convection zone. Another time t later, the temperature is increased again. And I've, I still have a vigorous convection zone. And a little bit later, um, I've expanded out again. But you can see this temperature is getting really hot. This is 10 to the 9 Kelvin. So I'm going to explain what these curves are. I'm going to go to the blackboard now and talk about what, what, what's happening and what these other two curves are that we put on this plot. And it has to do with what, I, what we call dynamical burning. So before I take this down, see if there's any questions, then I'm going to go to the blackboard. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so what I want to plot for you is a profile within the star. So this is now temperature versus pressure. My plot here is in density space, but I'm going to go to pressure space because I prefer it. And let's say here's what my profile looked like before the ignition. Uh, let's say this is 
carbon oxygen and this is helium. And I start burning and over time that's what the profile looks like. So what I'm building is a convection zone. This is a convecting region. Outside of here basically nothing's happened. So what happens during these shell burnings is that the material in this region is convecting. It's vigorously burning at the base. It's transporting heat out. But all of the energy from the nuclear reactions is simply just increasing the temperature in this region. That's all it's doing. So those luminosities I had, which got up to 10 to the 10 L sun, again, that's not coming out of the star. That's just the integral of epsilon dm. It's just the luminosity that's being generated in this burning shell. Okay. So, so the burning region is what we call fully convective. And the luminosity of burning in that shell is just the integral of epsilon dm over the convective region. Okay, so this is some ergs per second. And so all of this heat that's being generated is simply just taking this in one time step from here to there. And the next time step from there to there. And so the question is, when is this going to end? So one possibility is that it can get stuck at some point and, and be happy here because the heat coming out the top can match the energy being generated in the shell, right? And when you build a star, that's what you typically demand, is that you find a steady state. And when you have convective burning shells and stars, like in convective core, you eventually get to a place where the heat can get carried out via radiation, radiation diffusion, and the convective shell goes static and stays there. Okay, in these cases, that doesn't happen. The shell just keeps running away. Okay, um, for the helium case. So this is going to be different than the hydrogen. Okay, so all of this heat from the burning from burning is going into increasing the temperature over a large region. Increasing T over. convective zone. Okay? So this region that's convective, uh, if convection is efficient, what we mean by that is if the motions in this region are that it needs to get the heat from here even up to here, because remember the burning is only occurring really at the floor. So you still have to carry heat from here to here. The convection has to do that for you. If the convection is efficient, what we mean by that is that the velocities required, which I'm going to check, the velocities required are very subsonic, then this is basically uh, the adiabatic profile. So in that case, this slope is um, t is proportional to p to the 2 fifths. That's just the adiabat for an ideal gas. I'm just going to assume ideal gas. I'm not worried about electron degeneracy, even though it is going to matter. But I'll show you that for the real, for the, when I show the real results. OK. So the only thing I have to check then, so the calculation I'm going to do is just putting heat into this volume and just ask what's the rate at which the temperature increases in that volume. And so all you have to do is write down what the thermal content is. And I'm just going to assume for now it's an ideal gas. So that's 3 halves kT over mu mp dm, where this integral again is over the convective zone. Right? So that's just the thermal content integral over the convective zone. Does everybody see that? Just all the gas. I'm not put, this integration is just over the convective region. Nope, no radiation pressure. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Typically, you don't have a big problem with radiation pressure. You will. It can. It can hit you eventually. 
This depends on the electron degeneracy, too. OK, so we just have to do this integral. Right? Anybody want to guess what this integral is? Where's Udi when you need him? Well, I could do the integral formally. I could put in that power law, right? You know, I could put in this power law. I could do the integral. I'd get a 7 fifths. I'd feel really proud of myself. Um, or I could just say, well, what is it roughly? All right, so it's roughly 3 halves delta m, which is the mass of the shell, mu mp Boltzmann times the temperature at the base. Okay? And there's a, there is a prefactor when you do the integral, but let's just call it that. Okay? So that's what's happening. And so now if I want to get the evolution in time of this, um, I then just simply have that the luminosity is epsilon. And of course, this integral, we know how to do this integral, right? Epsilon dm, right? I'll just, right? Everybody with me? Okay. Uh, so that's the luminosity, and that's just going to go into changing the temperature. Yep. For this calculation, I'll show you the real calculation. Yeah. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah, it gets lifted pretty quickly. Is the Actually, it's nice to have this plot. We don't have the degeneracy line on here, but 10 to the 6. It does get lifted pretty quickly. Yeah, and that's why the pressure drops. So, yeah, I have a pressure coordinates in the next plot. OK, so there's a TB dot here, sorry. All right? So I just took the time derivative of this guy. OK, so there's a heating time which is the time scale I really want to get, which is the temperature of the base divided by the TB dot. Um, and this ends up just being uh, the sound speed squared. I'm going to skip some steps, divided by epsilon. So remember, uh, KBT base over mu MP is just C squared, okay? sound speed squared. Again, dropping 2 thirds and 3 halves and things. Okay, So that's the heating time. Uh, is going to be CS squared over epsilon. And again, this is epsilon is really the epsilon right at the base. Okay. All right. So what time scale should I be worried about? So this heating, so if epsilon, so okay, let's just be clear. As a gas heats up, the sound speed's increasing, but that's a, kind of a weak power law. But remember, this is epsilon from helium burning. For those of you who've done helium burning, it's very temperature sensitive. So this time scale is getting short really fast. So how short, at what point would you start to get worried? What's the time it takes? What's the dynamical time for a white dwarf? Anybody know? Minutes, if it's, if it's a big one, if it's a 0.6, that's right. right. It could be seconds if it's a massive white dwarf, right? OK. What about just the time it takes a sound wave to, to go over the thickness of the shell? Right? We could worry about that, too. That's even a shorter time than the time for a sound wave to go all through the star. So let's just look at that time scale. So that's the time scale uh, for a sound to traverse a scale height. Right, so that's just the thickness h divided by the sound speed, right? Where h is just the thickness of the shell. Okay. If I'm again just doing ideal gas, thickness of the shell is cs, uh, is CS squared over g is the scale height, right? And so if I put this in for this time, I'm going to get uh, cs over G, right? So maybe I should get worried. So let's call it worry. Worry when the heating time, which is CS squared over epsilon, gets shorter than the time scale 
for a sound wave to cross a scale height, Cs over G, or that epsilon exceeds the product of CSG. Okay? Uh, well, this happens, which is why I'm talking about it. Otherwise, I wouldn't talk about it. I want to do one more check, though, um, just as a sanity check of another way to physically think about what could be happening. So let me just pause for a minute. So I'm just going to tell you this, this can occur. It doesn't happen in hydrogen burning, but it does happen in helium burning. And you know, again, the nuclear physics doesn't know about gravity on a white dwarf. Right? So physically, there's no reason this, you know, couldn't, there's no law that says this shouldn't happen. This absolutely happens in the carbon oxygen cores of white dwarfs, except that the core G is zero, but let's not worry about that detail. You go off center, right? And, and there, that is the reason why carbon you know, burning can be explosive, but this is also true for helium. Well, the other thing to worry about is my approximation back here that the velocities of this convection were slow enough that I could actually maintain this beautiful story of an adiabatic profile. So let's check that. So I'm, I have to carry heat because really all of the burning is occurring right at the floor. There's nothing happening out here at all. Right? There's really nothing happening out here except just the heat's getting transported around. But I still have to carry this heat out and so I could get worried that the speeds to carry this heat out are starting to get supersonic. Okay? So how do we calculate that? Well, we have to ask what's the flux that I'm carrying through this zone. Um, so that flux is being carried by convective motions. So that's going to be the density of the fluid uh, times the convective velocity cubed. That's roughly the flux when I'm subsonic. And that flux is the luminosity divided by 4 pi r squared. Right? Is everybody OK? OK. So this says that the convective velocity cubed goes like L over 4 pi r squared rho. And I want to divide it by the sound speed cubed. So I'm going to put this as the sound speed squared times another sound speed. So that says that Vc over Cs cubed, this is the thing I want to keep less than 1, right? Looks like the luminosity, but the luminosity is epsilon delta m. All right, that's the luminosity I'm carrying. Divided by 4 pi r squared, a Cs. Well, what's rho times the sound speed squared? It's the pressure. Okay. Okay, and what's the pressure in a thin envelope? Well, I derived that last time. The pressure in a thin envelope is G, little g, times delta M divided by 4 pi r squared. All right, so if I put that in to this, I get that Vc over Cs cubed is epsilon. Uh, divided by GCS. And I've erased my other result. That was really smart. Right, well, it's the same thing again. Okay? So I had epsilon greater than CSG. Sorry, I just erased it. All right? So it's the same condition, back of the envelope. All right? So when epsilon gets of order CSG, I've got a problem. OK? All right. So before this happens, there's one other thing that should really start to worry all of you, which is that we've been living and calculating in 1D, because we love to do that, because it's easy. And it's usually right, but now I'm really starting to worry. So here's my star. Here's my core. I've got a shell out here. It's vigorously convecting. Right? And I've just shown a condition which I'm going to tell you I can violate, or I can definitely get into this condition, 
where I can't even get a sound wave to traverse this on the time scale in which the temperature is doubling. Okay, well that means you should start to worry. That means I cannot get a sound wave around the star at all. Okay, so an immediate concern is our approximation that everything's behaving the same across the star. So again, when we did NOVI, we didn't ask this question. We could, well, it was asked and answered privately. I didn't show you. Um, that you don't get into this regime. And so, you, so it's a really safe approximation to assume that the shell has adequate time to maintain what it should, because at least it's not evolving on a time scale faster than the sound travel time, the, the shorter than the time it takes for sound waves to get around. So that's one big concern is that you can actually start to have cause to think of breaking symmetry or one place runs away. And as you're going to see, as we start to worry about the outcome for this, uh, that can lead to, um, well, some interesting phenomena. Okay, so let me pause and see if there's questions. Svi has a question. You guys are good? Okay. Okay, how am I doing on time? Ten minutes? Who's my who's my clock keeper? Yeah. Huh? Maybe more. Yeah, maybe more. Okay. Okay, so any questions on this before I stop at the blackboard? Okay. All right, so let's bring back the blackboard the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so let me show you what the real calculation looks like. And this addresses some of Stroll's questions about all of the physics. So ignore the words, I've already explained everything. Let's just look at the plot. So this is from a paper by part of Ken Chen's thesis. Um, so what's shown here is the pressure at the base of a shell. This is on a one solar mass white dwarf and the temperature at the base. And what's plotted is a trajectory during a thermal instability for shells of different mass. So a 0.01 solar mass helium shell, a 0.05 and a 0.1. Okay. So let's do the 0.01 first. So this is in pressure coordinates. So remember if I stay geometrically thin, the pressure has to be constant. And these points are showing you the time scale for evolution. So it's a year, a month, a day, an hour. So what happens is this gets up to near radiation pressure, which is what Stroll was asking about. Here's where the total pressure of the base is a third AT to the fourth. So that's just, it's there, right? The, degener the, the degeneracy line's not shown here. So you can kind of imply it. Um, here's where the dynamical time equals the heating time, typically defined more or less in the way I just did it. So if I have a 0.05 solar mass shell, um, it gets to a much higher temperature before it starts to decline or and expand in this case. Uh, and then if it's a 0.1, it's really in this regime. It doesn't even, probably would not even get up to here. All right? You get to this point and you've got a problem. All right? So basically when you hit this line, you should start to really be worried. And often the codes don't let you do it. Right? Because what happens in most codes is it just takes that parcel of fluid and like that burns it to completion. Okay, so you go to nickel 56 if you're at high pressures in a really short time. So if I go back to this plot that I showed earlier, these are showing the ratio. So this is when the T dynamical equals T heat. This is when it's still a factor of 10 away. So this one might have been safe. Even for this one, you probably stopped the ability to communicate around the star. And so you start to have to worry about, about that issue as well. Okay, so what you can tell is that uh, for this mass white dwarf, the bigger the shell, the better. That's true for all of them, but you can actually calculate what mass shell you need. Okay, and that was the, the, this original plot we had in that paper showing as a function of the core mass of the white dwarf, what's the mass of the envelope that you would have to have of helium to get you into this regime. So roughly 
above this solid line, you're, you're safely, safely in this unsafe place to be, uh, which is that basically it's a case that might well become dynamical. Um, what's shown here is the regime for that initial simulation I showed for the very last flash from those AM CAM van systems of what the ignition masses were. And when we started doing this work a decade ago, the interesting thing for us was that we were finding naturally from binary evolution that we could get ourselves into this regime for the last flash uh, of a mass that would be adequate to get to dynamical burning. And I'm calling it dynamical burning because we don't know the outcome, right? I mean, there, I'm going to talk about possible outcomes, but by no means do we uh, know what it is. So um, I already said this, it can become dynamical. So it didn't happen with hydrogen burners, though I, I, I think I should go back and check. There could be some weird regimes, really weird regimes, but it's probably worth checking. Um, I'm going to talk about this more in, my, in, in um, a little bit now, but mostly probably in the third lecture on this whole topic. Uh, maybe it leads to a detonation. And so what a detonation is, is a sudden burning of all the fluid so strong that you drive a shock wave. And that shock wave is then the ignition for the compression, the, the cause of the ignition going forward. As the fluid element gets shocked, the temperature rises behind the shock to a temperature adequate to complete the burning. Um, detonations are fun. Uh, they're a lot of fun to calculate. They're probably even more fun to experience. Um, but I will, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And what that might do for us is actually allow us to ignite the underlying carbon oxygen, something uh, Dan mentioned. Uh, yesterday, and I'm not sure he's going to do more on that or not. So we'll, we'll keep coordinating, Dan. So I'm not going to do this problem now. What I want to do for the last 10 minutes, okay, <laughs> is briefly talk about the other scenario. So there's two binary scenarios. Uh, so the first one was the scenario with a, a white dwarf as the donor. But the other scenario is one with the helium burning star. And I'm really going to focus on one type of helium burning star, which are called subdwarf B stars. So how many of you have never heard of an SDB star? Raise your hand high with pride. Excellent. OK. So what a subdwarf B star is, OK, a B star, OK, if you don't know what a B star is, a B star is a star of a certain spectral type. <laughs> it's hot, right? It's quite hot. But the subdwarf is. Right, is the same temperature, right, but not nearly as luminous. Solar mass. Okay, thank you, Stroh. Okay. <laughs> um, so what these are are basically uh, the the a core of what was roughly something like the mass of the sun. So the, what'll happen to the sun in about five billion years? It'll burn up. It's helium at the center. It'll have a ball of about a tenth of a solar mass. At that point, it goes up the red giant branch. As it goes up the red giant branch, it's doing hydrogen shell burning, building up the helium core mass to 0.48 solar masses, which we're confident we know to two digits. Okay? When it gets to 0.48 solar masses, the helium ignites in what's called a helium core flash and turns itself into a helium burning star okay? of 0.48 solar masses. If by some magic, during this event in a binary, it loses the hydrogen envelope completely down to a small mass, it will become an SDB star. Okay? And we see many of them. They're, all, they're almost all in binaries, pretty much, that we know about. There's some, yeah, there's, there's some, yeah, there's some weird ones. Um, they're called the extended horizontal branch in globular clusters. And so these are systems which we know of in great detail, which have lost their hydrogen envelope, but they are 0.48 solar masses. They live for 120 million years. We think we know that number. Uh, burning their helium. Well, it ends up uh, that there are now two systems. So, so basically, this was a scenario that had been talked about theoretically for at least 30 years as a way to build up a big helium shell. Um, there was one that was found not that long ago but it was in such a wide orbit that by the time it would come into contact, it would be done helium burning. It would have made a white dwarf, in which case it wasn't of interest. There's one really good system, CD minus 30, blah, 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 uh, which is in a tight enough system that we can calculate, actually, as it 
undergoes gravitational wave losses, there's still time, uh, there's, it still has adequate time so that when it comes into contact, it's still burning, and we could do a mass transfer scenario with that. It also has a white dwarf uh, companion of about 0.74, and oh look, 0.47, that's pretty good. I said 0.48, okay? And there's a new system that was found in PTF, Thomas Kupfer has. And the expectation is there's more coming of these. So when you have something you can calculate on the sky, it's good to do it. So what do these look like generically? This is what they look like generically. The systems are 40, 80 minutes. Gravitational waves drives them in. An SDB star will come into contact and fill its Roche lobe at 20 minutes. So it starts to do mass transfer. This is the mass transfer. It's undergoing, driven by gravitational wave emission. Whittles the star down till it becomes basically a degenerate helium ball and comes back out and this, these points on this are for different mass white dwarves, a 0.6, a 0.8, and a 1, showing where the helium that you accumulate will finally flash, the first flash. Okay? And you can see the one solar mass white dwarf ignites sooner. That's just because I don't have to add as much mass. Okay? Well, these are great for becoming dynamical. That's what's shown here. So this is the plot again from Ken Shen's original paper. The heating time is 10 times the dynamical time. And the dynamical time for different scenarios, um, these get really close. This orange star is the CD, that 30 system, if you march it forward in time for the original calculation. And these points that are solid are ones where already they've lost sort of a causal contact. So even for these, when the, the shell would ignite and start to burn, it, could, it, it will lose causal contact. What I mean by that is it won't be time for sound waves to go around the star. Um, you can ask about going through the star. I, I'm doing going around the star. Uh, then just to flatter slash embarrass Evan Bauer, uh, who's in the audience, uh, he recently uh, wrote a paper with Josiah Schwab incorporating one more piece of physics which has to do with electron captures on nitrogen-14. It's, uh, it's a detail we're not going to go into in great detail, but re-ran the same system again with that physics involved. And that ends up getting the ignition to occur even deeper in the star. And now, very safely, uh, all of these ignitions for this, this CD object are above this dynamical outcome. So again, it's one of these systems that we can say, maybe this is now the third one today, where in a million years, or something, uh, something exciting is going to happen. So uh, where, where the helium shell that's accumulated on this object will be between 0.1 and 0.15 and will basically be dynamical. Okay. So that's a perfect place for me to stop. I think I'm at a good point, and I'll take further questions. Thank you. There, there's some binary, it's, you have to have a pretty fine-tuned binary scenario that lets you do a lot of mass transfer and stay in that stable regime. So I'm not going to say it's cooked up, but it's cooked up. You want to add 0.4 solar masses onto the white dwarf. So what's the scenario? So the scenario is that you find a binary that's in the right regime to get stable burning, and then you successfully stay in that regime for a long enough time to add, you know, half a solar mass. So the major problem is, so I'll talk about a binary, there, there are, the main binary scenario that lets you do that is one that's providing even more mass than that, and then you ask for the wind to get rid of the rest of the mass. So basically you overwhelm, you overwhelm it. Um, that's the best way to do it. The standard problem still is that you're accumulating helium, which is then going to undergo its own thermonuclear flash. That's the major issue with those super with the super soft sources on on the on the on the sort of physics side. All right, there's other stuff that was mentioned about the X-ray emissions inadequate in distant galaxies. I just strolled, strolled, or somebody said, was it Dan? Somebody said that yesterday. Dan Dan said that.
Sorry, say again. If, I, if I'm doing carbon burning? Uh, so when you do carbon ignition at the core of a white dwarf, as Dan mentioned, you have this long simmering phase. Um, and that, if you just keep going, the temperature rises and rises and rises. And eventually it too becomes dynamical. And you have to decide what you're going to do. So typically they launch, as Dan showed, they launch plumes is the sort of decision they make about how to simulate when you go dynamical. They typically don't want it to just go to a direct detonation. <laughs>